there. Welcome to Alive and Streaming. Before I introduce my next guest and a good friend, I just want to give a shout out to my friend Mike Percali, who's done all of my Alive and Streaming flyers and ad met that you guys see on social. So, Mike, thank you. And now, without further ado, please welcome one of the greatest bass players in metal, very underrated, Joey Vera from Armored Saint. Hello, Joey. Hey, man. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ted. It's good to see you. And thanks for having me, man. No, I'm first stoked. of all, first of all, Joey, thank you for being on the show and happy birthday. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time on your birthday to come. What else here. am I going to do? Come on. Well, well, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Oh. Could you hear that? Yeah, yeah. All right, here I go. I haven't played this. I might be playing it wrong, but this is for you. If what the I, hell? If I hit wrong notes, anyone, I'm just going off the cuff right here. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Oh! <laughs> that rules. Yeah, dude, Joey, that's happy, awesome. Happy birthday, bro. Thank you so much, man. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. No Please. one's ever done that for me before. That's great. And that's the first time <laughs> I actually did something like that on my show, man. <laughs> Brad. Yeah, Thank yeah, you, man. yeah, 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 dude, dude. Thanks so you, much. What are you, uh, mid to late 30s, bro? Yeah, something like that. 30-ish. 30-ish. You, know. you know what? I have to say, dude, you know, this week I've been on an Armored Saint kick. I've been looking at some old photos. I go, this dude does tears not in my eyes. age, dude. You look good. Well, it, it's the lighting in here. It's something I pay for extra, but thank you. No, you look good, man. It's yeah. Awesome. yeah like, I was like, oh, shit. And Mark texts me, go, dude, Joey Vera's birthday. I go, I know. I got something special for him on the stream. So <laughs> I just, I didn't, I just that did right. that on the whim, dude. I was like, I hope I hit the right notes. That's right. You did it. It's, it's you know, it's instinct. Yeah, it's insane. You dude, played from the heart and the gut. That's I great. did. I did for you, bro. <laughs> dude, <Thank> you. <laughs> there's a few things I want to talk about uh, with you here. Is okay. I don't want to take up a lot of your time. No, and, no, um, no. I'm, I'm glad to be here, man, really. Uh, cool, I'm, st cool. I'm stoked. Um, I know you're like, you, you know, Fate's Warning, you know, engine, uh, motor sister, producer, mixer, phenomenal bass player. What do you do outside of music? What is your like Zen thing you do? <laughs> a um, couple of things. Uh, and I like, believe it or not, I like cooking a lot. Um, oh. Cooking <laughs> is, is really Zen for me. Um, both my wife, Tracy, and I, we're foodies. We love to cook. We get nerdy about it. You know, we get competitive with each other about it. Like we're also like a great team together. So cooking is super Zen for me. That's one thing. I also like, you know, I like getting outside. I like hiking, um, traveling still, believe it or not, even though we haven't really had a chance to travel in the last totally whatever months. But, um, but those are some things. I don't really have any like hobbies per se, I wouldn't say necessarily, but, um, but those are some things that are like, I really, really get into. I like, really, really, enjoy getting away from work and doing those things so what do you you trying to be the next bobby flay or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny about the food, it's funny about the food network is uh, i'm so nerdy that i watched i started watching the food network network when it was on local access cable back in the late 80s um so it wasn't even like a network thing yet it wasn't even on regular what we call cable now it was just like local tv and I used to watch like Emerald's first show before it was BAM and all that crap and all the wow. commercial crap that came later. Too Hot Tamales, like anyone knows who they are, the, you know, Mary Sue Milliken and uh, Susan Feniger. I'm a total dork when it comes to food. So that's, I mean, we're all dorks in our own way about things, you know what I mean? Totally. Um, yeah. so, so what's your favorite dish to cook? What's the dish you, you're most proud of? Like, I, oh, I, I can kill it. I can kill it on this dish. Uh... 
I don't really have like one thing, but um, I mostly, I, also, I tend to go more towards like Mediterranean cooking. I'm, okay. I've, been, I've been a vegetarian for a long time, although I'm not really a vegetarian because I started eating fish about okay. 15, 20 years ago. So pescatarian, I guess. But um, I, I like cooking on the grill a lot, believe it or not. And that's, I, I like, I actually cook a lot of meats, even though I'm not, I don't eat it. I cook it for like my wife or friends, which is like, totally, it's counterintuitive for like someone who doesn't eat meat. But I, t- I took it as a challenge to try to get good at it. Yeah. And I've gotten pretty good at it. I make killer steaks and killer chickens and stuff on the grill. Um, so I don't know. It's a lot, I like a lot of variety of things that I cook. It's not really one particular thing, but it's mostly like Mediterranean, I would say. Gotcha. Is that, yeah. something, is that something you think you would have pursued if you didn't do music? You know, not really. Uh, it's, I've, I did contemplate it a few times during the early 90s and mid 90s, but um it's a crazy life like being a chef it's like way like we think being a musician is a lot of hard work which it is yeah but like you can't be a chef and have a life it's really really hard it's like 16 hour days forever you're in debt forever until you finally break even it's really really hard work from what i've read anyway i've never done it but and every time i've read things about it sorry it's okay. Um, uh, it's it's like my hats off to those people who are in the service industry because it's it's crazy, crazy hard work. Yeah, it um, seems I, like it. Yeah, I think that I've found. A, I think that being a musician, you're you're able to have, you know, you can have hard work, uh, put a lot of hours into what you do, but there's also a way to balance it with other stuff in your life, you know. Yeah. And and I that's what I enjoy about being a musician is I've. I can have uh, found a way to balance the life away from music, you know, and I think that being in the food industry, being a chef, it's much harder to do that. Um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, but, I mean, lo- it's, it, it's crazy, but you know, you don't see what's going on in the background. You just see what's served to you. You know what I mean? You're exactly. like, yeah. And you, exactly. compl- and you complain because the fries are just not as crispy <laughs> or something. You're like, these dudes are doing 16 hour days, man. Relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there, is there anybody in your band that loves cooking as much as you? Um, I think our, I think our drummer Gonzo recently started cooking a lot more. He's, he's always cooked a little bit, but I think that in the last, especially in, since lockdown, he's, he started cooking a lot more because everybody's home now, you know, it's a yeah. lot more time on our hands. So he's been cooking a lot more insanely too. Um, and I think that's about it. I think Gonzo is the other guy who likes to cook a lot. Wow, man. Yeah. yeah. One of these days I, when the world opens up, I just got to come over. I'm going to say, hey, bro, I like filet mignon. I like skirt steak. You know, I oh, want... I'll hook you up. <laughs> Please I do. Up. I, I love me. Please do. Dude, <laughs> I, before I get to the new album, which uh, I fucking love, uh, you know, I want to talk you. about you you got the merciful fate gig huh well uh you know on on uh on paper i I haven't actually done anything yet yeah i mean of course the (laughs) pandemic but you know there was news that you were ready to go with them you know yeah they um they uh approached me this was quite a while ago uh obviously um and um they asked me to fill in basically because uh, Tim Hansen was still with us, um, but he was going through some chemo and it was kind of unsure about whether he was going to be well enough to do some dates that they had booked um, for summer of 20. I, I'm, I, I'm forgetting now. I guess it was it was last summer. Yeah. So um, I said, well, you know, it was like, we're not sure if you can't do it. Could you fill in? It was one of those things. And I said, well, I was honored. Like, uh, yeah, I would, you know, I'm free and I could do it. So yes, I'll do it. And I thought, I mean, this is amazing that they even considered talking to me. Um, so they, that was done. And I, and the whole time I was like thinking to myself, well, 
it's just, a, it's just, I'm in the wings, you know, and I kept thinking, well, Timmy's going to pull through and it'll be fine. And unfortunately several months passed and then he passed away and it was just awful. Um, and then they reached back out to me and they said, look, you know, the dates are still on. Can you do it? And I'm like, well, I, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, about to honor him and honor the band and the fans and everything. And, and then of course, a couple months after that, that's when all this stuff happened with yeah. COVID and it was right around the time you guys were coming back from that European tour. It was right then. And then it was like, okay, now we're not doing these summer festivals. And then, so then I just, I put that on the back burner, the, the fates, I mean, the merciful fate thing. Um, and so this keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And we were supposed to do dates this summer. Yeah. And those, all those dates got pushed until from what I'm told next year. So it's another year away. So, you know, to answer your question in the long winded form, uh, yeah, I'm supposed to be doing these dates and I just haven't done anything yet. Um, they have asked me to play on some recordings as well um, because I think they're writing. Um, so I've been getting some demos and things like that in may email, but nothing further has gone from that. So I don't know what direction that's going. So it's all kind of up in the air still, but if everything works out, I hope I would, I mean, you know, I'm an old school fan, like a lot of us are. And so yeah. I would be honored to be able to do this and it would be really fun. And I'd be, it'd be so weird. <laughs> you know, I'm on stage with Merciful Fate. I mean, that's just totally. crazy. Totally. You know so I mean? it's going to be, a, it's going to be when the world opens up, which I know it will, it's going to be a, you got to find a balance between the saint and the fate. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And, fate, and Fate's Warning. And wow, dude. Motor Sister and everything else. And, you know, I, I've been lucky in the past so far to be able to maneuver several different bands kind of in my life. But yeah, th it's going to be even tougher because it's going to th the gates are going to open and then everyone's going to be rushing to get in for everything. And that includes musicians looking for work and bands and gigs and fans. And it's, everybody's like it's gonna be crazy but it's gonna be crazy man it's, i mean how do you do it dude how do you manage between fate mo i mean uh fate's warning armored saint motor sister and family life what's, yeah what's the secret you know, bro and barbecue and chef and all that good <laughs> stuff it's hard sometimes but i've been trying to like try to keep everything on the table and like have foresight far enough in advance to say like okay I got this going on in June. I got this going on in July. And this is happening in September. And you try to let everybody know what's going on and try not to piss anybody off, you know, yeah. family members and band members and people at the label, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, and for the most part, I've been pretty lucky up until now, not having pissed anybody off too badly. So, so up until this point, I've been able to maneuver all that stuff. Um, it's going to be tough in the future, I think, for managing that kind of stuff. Like I said, it's going to be probably a lot of things coming in all at once. But um, I don't know. Wish me luck, I guess. Oh, dude, I wish you all the best of luck. <laughs> all right. Since this is kind of like a, a DA platform and all that, you had fond memories of the Bay Area. One that I heard it was an anniversary, not that long ago with uh metallica armored state and death angel at the kabuki yeah do you that remember rad, that man. do you remember those shows really good I, I do um i remember it's funny because i had forgotten the the one thing i forgot about was that that first gig was it the first gig or second gig where da showed up late i think it was the first night actually yeah. Rob, um, i think rob's I think Rob was traveling to the show in his vehicle that he was in broke down or something. Yeah. So they arrived, I don't know, 20 minutes late or half an hour late from doors. So they only got to set up and play like four songs or two songs or something. Yeah. <laughs> but then the next night was like their first, like, all right, we got a full set, you know, and we were backstage. And I think I wrote this on your, on your guys, uh, <laughs> Instagram feed when it came out a couple of weeks ago uh the first song started right and then we're but we're like getting ready you know we're still wearing armor at this time so we're like putting on the armor and strapping in and stuff 
<laughs> and then the the like the first verse starts or something and then mark comes out with this scream and it was the mo- it was the highest pitched like beyond halford and dickinson and and like it was like what the fuck was that it was the highest pitch scream and it lasted so long. We were like, looked at each other like, what the hell is, was that a siren or what was that? <laughs> and it was, we're fucking like, all right, hang on a sec. Hang on with the armor and the oil and whatever the, the <laughs> WD-40, put that down. Let's go see. We all went upstairs and we're like watching the side stage. Like what the fuck is happening here? It was so cool. Wow. Um, man. But those gigs were great. You know, it was, uh, we always had this like, we saw the Bay Area as our second home um, because, you know, California boys and all that. And, and I know it was a different scene there than it was in Hollywood, but we never associated ourselves with like being a quote unquote Hollywood band. Yeah. Although we're proud, we're proud of being from LA because it's where we're from. Um, but the, the glam scene kind of took over this image about what LA was about. And rightfully so it just was, it became like what it was known for, but yeah we were like a little bit earlier than that. And we just felt like we had a lot more in common with what maybe what was happening in the Bay area, which was a little bit more like what was going on in Europe. Yeah. So that's where we were all at. We were all about like, you know, London and the marquee and, you know, UK bands and European bands. And so we always had a great time playing Bay or Bay area. And, uh, and th- those shows were just, I mean, it's just legendary, you know, it's great. Yeah. And you guys played a couple of headlining shows later on up at the Stone or something like that, if you could remember. Yeah, we played the Stone uh, in in the city, and those were killer. There was just always crazy shows, you know. We played Ruthie's Inn um, once or twice. Um, there was another Stone too in Berkeley, right? Wasn't there a Stone over Keystone there? Or Berkeley. Keystone, Keystone Berkeley, yeah, right. So yeah, had- great too. Great shows, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was too young. I, I was too young to see those shows at the time, you know, but yeah, I, I heard about them. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a great time uh, with DA on that tour we did in Australia. That was uh, that was an amazing time. Um, it was our first time playing there. I think it was your first time, too. Yeah, yeah that was March right? of March of 09. That was our first time out there, too. Right, right. Yeah. And those it was, were killer shows. They were killer. You know, it was funny. I was going through some old videotapes. And I ha- I filmed you, was it you, Jeff, uh, Mark, Rob, I think it was Phil. You guys did ACDC and Andy. John, oh, yeah, didn't, yeah. John didn't sing in Perth. That's right. Yeah. That Perth kid, that Perth kid was crazy because yeah. John got so sick. It's his only show. I believe this is the only show in his entire life of working. So like 40 some odd years first gig he's never showed up to ever wow he, he was that ill he was like in his bed like in a fetal position and i was like dude do you need to go to the hospital or what and he's like oh, no i just can't you know he couldn't get out of bed and so rather than cancel um yeah me and jeff me and jeff traded off and we asked the crowd you know hey we're gonna play for you it's either that or we cancel and and uh the fans i think appreciated that you know, Mark helped us out on a song. You guys came out and jammed with us. And, you know, you make the best of it at that point. And that was the cool thing. I think the fans that were at that gig, you know, they'll never forget that. You know, yeah. that was a really special thing, you know. Yeah, as soon as um, I digitize that tape, I'll send it to you. I would love to see that. Um, yeah. Because there's, there's one thing that's on YouTube. Um, and it's, I forget what song it is. It might be Madhouse or something. One of our songs that we played that's me and Jeff going back and forth. It's pretty weird to watch, you know, like, where's John? <laughs> yeah, but you guys had to do what you had to do and the fans appreciated it, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah. like, you gotta, you gotta, like, adapt, you know? Like, you, you've been in those situations sometimes, you know? Like, you, you gotta be, like, like the military sometimes. And, like, yeah. you just gotta adapt, you know? <laughs> but I'll tell you this. If Mark is sick, he's going to sing. And if he can't sing, I ain't going to sing. <laughs> Hell no, you know. Uh, well, Rob could probably pull it off or, you know, he could probably pull off some songs as long as he remembered all the lyrics. Right. That's yeah. the hard part. But, you know, it's it's. Well, that's not the hard part. The hard part's singing, too. But yeah, that's <laughs> the hard part, dude, punching the sky. What an incredible, oh. 
incredible record, dude. I've been listening to it, you know, like. It, Thank you. I had a stream last week. I, I had Stefan Shirazi on. And I this, watched that for a little bit. That was cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that was and great. As soon as I got off, you know, I had a good, I felt good. I had a good stream. I go, shit. You know, I got Joey Vera next week. I want to listen to the new record because I haven't heard of, heard all of it. And I'll tell you this. And I was telling Trisha, my wife, this other than a new DA record that we get, you know, when you get it finally mixed and mastered and all that, mm. excluding DA, Punching the Sky is a, the first record in a very, very long time that I played start to finish. Wow. Yeah, that's, dude. That's high praise. Dude, that, I mean, thank you. The songs are excellent. The sequence, the production. You guys are on fire on that record, dude. There's a lot of peaks and valleys, which I really like, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the Thank you. The opening track, Standing on the Shoulders of Giant, is awesome. And my Thank you. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm torn because I have favorites, you know? Huh. Right <laughs> now, it's between th four songs. Four songs. Wow. That's a lot of that's a lot of favorites. <laughs> it's a lot of favorites. Uh, I'll tell cool. you, standing on the shoulders, of giants is one. My jurisdiction, number cool. two. Do wrong to none, and missile cool. the gun. And missile the gun. Wow! But this week, missile the gun is at number one, dude. Wow! Missile the gun okay. is at number cool. one. And I have Great. to say, dude, listening to it, and 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 I'll, and I'll get in depth here. When I when I heard that song, I was like, it's the catchiest song out of the whole record for me. I like I like catchy tunes. I was listening to it cool. Then the other night, let me look around here. It's the internet. I, I got I got a little baked. You cool. know what I mean? Oh I right. Put that on. Oh, headphones good. Yeah, I put it on headphones. Listen to the whole album. Then I listened to Missile the Gun. I was like, there's a lot of shit going on on that song, man. You guys are like, everyone is on fire on that song. <laughs> That's now, great. Before I get in depth with the album and before, and I want to play the video, the missile, the gun on this stream. I have it set up. Oh, rad. Cool. I want to ask you, when did you start writing for this record? How long did it take from the start of this record to when you finished recording the record? Quite a while. Um, we, we normally work in a very slow way. Um, so let's see. I've had to answer this before, and I think I've forgotten the answer to this. I think we started, loosely started in the late, like December of 17. Okay. Um, but the groove didn't really start rolling until, I would say, February of 18. Okay. That sounds about right. And so we write in a way where we don't, um, we don't have like a deadline from Metal Blade. We don't have management be breathing down our necks or anything so we kind of work like laces fair whenever we feel like it kind of thing i mean we get it in our heads like hey let's start writing a record but it's not like five days a week you know band practice and and writing and until we're done it's more like you know let's fit it into our daily lives you know between taking our kids to school or to soccer practice or the hockey practice and time with our families and whatever um so our the way that we the speed at which we work is pretty drawn out so um we tend to go in like bursts so like when we first started writing like i said in early 18 is really when the ball started rolling we'll write like four or five songs fairly quickly like what, what i mean by that is like in about a month and a half to two months four or five songs come to come into focus and yeah. then it'll be downtime like almost nothing for a couple of months and then it picks back up again in early summer kind of thing and it goes like that so we finished writing probably around well we finished writing around fall of 19 is that right yeah then we began recording um in december of 19 finished with the mixing and mastering in april of 20 okay. so it took that long what is it a, a year and a couple of months is it something yeah. like that let's just say um, a year and a couple of months no i just want to know because the record is 
what was what was your state of mind from the time of writing till recording? I mean, what were you listening to? What was going on in your personal life? Because I kind of want to know. Because it listening to the record, it seems like you guys there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, it seems like you guys were listening to a ton of different types of music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or yeah, you know, something was going on because it's awesome. <laughs> Well, you're, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, uh, intuitive of you to say that um, because I was listening to a lot of different stuff and it was mostly in the beginning, like be- at the beginning of the jumping off part where I start to feel motivated and inspired by stuff. Yeah. Um, and a lot, you know, I had to be honest, like I'm mostly inspired by the music I grew up on and that's music from the seventies. Um, and it was, this was the same this has been the same case with me as as a writer for the last three records we've done. So since La Raza in 2009 to Win Hands Down in 15, and then the same case as this one. And I often reflect back on just the fav- my favorite bands and the favorite kind of music that I liked, you know. But in particular with this record, um, and I, I did get in these weird kind of <laughs> rabbit holes and the band Chicago, believe it or not, was one okay. of them. Um, <laughs> and it's not the sappy, like, disco era that maybe is more popular. It's the earlier stuff, the more progressive and kind of um, funky uh, records that they put out before they went, like, really mainstream and commercial. So a lot of instrumentation stuff that I was drawn to, a lot of arrangement things that I was really drawn to. And I try to bring those things into what I'm writing. Yeah. So like, for instance, uh, there's a song called Bark No Bite on the yep. record. It's like it was, towards the end of the album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, is it the last song or it's, it's close to the end? Yeah. yeah, you're right. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I've been listening but, to it, bro. <laughs> it's, actually, um, it's actually the third to the last song right before Unfair. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's an existing example of, uh, I wrote, this is one of the first songs I wrote and the intro to that song, I originally wrote that with horn section in my mind. So the whole, all the guitar parts are basically like trombone sax and trumpet parts that I had written out. And I, you know, and, and I wrote this intro and it's the way it sets up the song and it never repeats again. It's just an intro. I totally got that from Chicago. Wow. And so that's one of the, an example of how something like that would influence me. And of course it came time to make the demo and recording. And I'm like, what? I was like, should I actually use horns? And I'm like, nah, nah, let's keep it all, let's keep it rock, you know? So yeah. I just played it all with guitars and stuff, but that's an example of how that happened. So Chicago is one, um, you know, of course I'm always referencing other bands that I, I'm a huge fan of like Thin Lizzy, UFO, um, uh, Jethro Tull, you know, some slightly progressive stuff gets kind of gets its way in there. Um, you know, John and I, John and I write the majority of the songs. So we're both like uh, R&B fans. So we're always trying to find ways to bring like Earth, Wind and Fire um, into what we do it's and... funny you say that because I, <laughs> I i i could hear that in the chorus of lone wolf you it know has a, it has a gospel feel to it you that's know? that is you hit the nail on the head right there um the way the chorus was written originally um there there's a big downbeat on the chorus and originally john didn't have anything there it was just it was just empty like music yeah. just boom and then he says the words lone wolf and and I was like, it kind of needs something like right on that downbeat. And so you hit the nail on the head. I go, let's do an art, let's do an earth, wind and fire thing. Like, let me just put these vocals down. And, and I didn't know what else to do. Like I should, should it be a lyric or should it be a, a, a line or something? But I just said, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so I just said, yeah. And then I was like, I don't know if this is right or not. And he goes, oh, that sounds great. It sounds like, Ver, you know, Verdine White and, you know, and Maurice White and I'm like, should we let's keep it? Oh, fuck it, it sounds cool. So we just yeah. left it. That's, I that's that. another example of Earth, Wind, and Fire making its way in, and and we're stoked on that because we want to find ways to, you know, pay homage to bands that influenced us, but also make music that is like something that comes from us. That's you know, 
we just want to write great songs and great music and we don't want to be confined to like, you know, we, you can only write heavy metal and it can't have anything else. It has to be in this neat little box. And, and we want to break out of that a little bit, you know, and yeah. challenge ourselves as writers and challenge our listeners too. And, you know, it's fun. It is dude. Like, like my jurisdiction, the, the verses like uh, Jeff, excuse me, Jeff and, Phil are doing something completely different on the guitars and you and Gonzo are holding it down. And mm -hmm. here comes John singing on the top of it. It's like really yeah. rocking and funky, but just these tones are just heavy. Yeah. I mean, that's another one too. I mean, it's maybe kind of obvious, but it's kind of our nod. We've always kind of had this uh, Aerosmith thing on occasion. And this is another song as an example of how a band like Aerosmith, American hard rock blues based bands rubbed off on us. And we, I think every record we've made since 1984, uh, maybe not so much the first record, but um, we've always kind of tried to uh, embrace that part of, uh, a, a part of our influences, you know? So we've always kind of had these, we've always tried to write songs that had this bluesy swagger to it every now and then. And, and this is another one, you know? Yeah. Just, we just, it's a, it's a cool vehicle for John because uh, John's a very blues based kind of singer himself. And it's a great vehicle for him to just fucking really shine, you know, and he sounds amazing on that song. His sounds great on the whole record. He does. Dude. I mean, I, like you I know? said, I think you guys are on fire equally, equally, man. I mean, Thank now you. I'm going to play the video to Missile the Gun. I sure. like this song. It's catchy, dude. I mean, the riffs sound, those, those riffs sound really hard to play, bro. <laughs> I was like, going, what are they doing? It's like a lot of staccato stuff and, and Gonzo's going off. It, it's cool. So I'm going to play it for everyone. Brad, let's do it. Let's do it. I better not get these goddamn commercials here, man. Sometimes it happens to me. Here we go. <laughs> this is cool. Wow. Oh, wait. here we go. Is it playing? There we go. Oh, sorry.
Dude. Cool. Ripping. I got song. to watch the video again, too. <laughs> it's a great song, dude. It's a great song, man. Thank you. You know, it's just yeah. good melodies, good hooks, the riff, everything. You guys are on fire cool. on that one, man. Cool. Thank you. you know? Yeah, so, that's a fun well, one. Was that, where did that song come in in the songwriting process? Early, middle, end? Uh... That's a good question. Um, I think this one was actually pretty early, um, to be honest with you. It's one of the first batch of, I'd say, six or seven, five or six songs. It's in the, so it's in the early stages, I would say. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, obviously a nod to uh, New Wave of British Heavy Metal. For me, anyway, I think that's something that stoked my inspiration, for sure. Just reminds me of like an old... I don't know, Diamond Head song or something like that, you know. It has, that, least, feel, I, it has that feel to it, though. Yeah, sure. yeah, overall. And, and then, you know, play with the arrangements and stuff. But overall, it feels like that, the riff and, you know, this tempo and everything. Um, you know, it feels like a new wave British heavy metal, but on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? Going back to the album, like I said, there's a lot of, you know, it's peaks and valleys. There's a lot of influence and flavors. And I guess... It comes, I guess, I would like to say it came from your cooking because you're all into different types of spices, this and that. So it seems like it bled into the music. Like, I want to try different things instead of just yep. the same old, you know, dish. Yes. Um, variety is something that for sure that I always try to put in there, you know. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know if I get bored with the same old thing all the time over and over, or if it's like, I want to challenge ourselves as writers, but I think that, I don't know. I just think it's more interesting for me really. And, you know, like I try to think about like some of my favorite bands growing up, you know, a lot of those bands, a lot of the bands that I loved growing up had a lot of diversity. Um, like I mentioned Thin Lizzy earlier and yeah. UFO, um, those both of those bands, if you listen to their records from their catalog, it's it's a variety of things. There's slow songs, there's kind of folky songs, and then there's hard rock songs, and there's ver on the verge of metal songs. Um, bands, I was a huge, a huge uh, influence. I mean, a huge fan of Queen, also a band oh, that I love. <laughs> I liked it was a Queen freak in the mid '70s, you know. So, Night at the Opera, Sheer Heart Attack, you know, just that era was like, oh my god, I just loved everything. And talk about a diverse band, you know. So, a lot of bands that influenced us, not just me, but all of us, as yeah. in Armored Saint, we listened to a lot of different kinds of music. We got into jazz fusion at some point. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, R&B and soul was a big influence to us, too. So all those things, you know, we just started putting in our music little by little. And so at this point where we are now, it's like kitchen sink, you know, all, you know, all is fair right now. It all goes in and we, we find a way to, you know, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. And then I have these conversations with John a lot about like, look, we don't want to like, we're not trying to alienate anybody here. We want, yeah. you know, we, we know where we come from. You know, we are, we come from we're early 80s metal band and we know that. So it's not like we're trying to shed that. Yeah. But it's more like, let's work within those confines, if you want to call it a confine. Um, but we can also like, you know, eh, just etch it out, stretch, you know, stretch a little bit, push the boundaries a little bit, you know, keep it within context. But still be able to satisfy ourselves without yeah. being without com being completely selfish you know yeah. it is yeah. it is a little sprinkle selfish. sprinkle yeah. awesome you know yeah and there's the food analogy again it's yeah like, you know a little bit of oregano here a little bit of basil and some how about some red pepper you know like you gotta you can make it work yeah i mean with this out <laughs> with this album you did a great job but you there was enough spice dude there's it's cool. The dish is great, dude. I'm glad you brought up the headphone thing earlier. And because uh, this is another thing that I grew up with, and I'm sure most of us did. Um, yeah. Wearing headphones. And when you were when you were growing up and as a kid, a lot of times you you'd go into your room and you'd put on if you're as old as I am, you put on the LP or cassette or whatever you were yeah. growing up and you'd be alone in your room 
and you'd put on headphones, you know, because you could crank it and you wouldn't have to bother your parents or whatever. Yeah. And so I was, I'm always hyper aware of the stereo spectrum in your head. And so I love stuff that starts going around and it's panning left and right. And something pops up on the right side and something pops up on the left. Obviously a big Pink Floyd fan as well. Um, so I personally mix, I don't mix the records, but I work with Jay Rustin a lot. And I'm, and I'm always asking him like, you know, please pay attention to, you know, boom, boom, boom. Like it's gotta be chaotic sometimes and it's gotta move right and left. And, you know, I want people to experience that. I want people to listen to it in that sense and get that sort of surprise thing, you know, in the mix itself. And, yeah. you know, you mentioned thing that there's a lot of going on in the, in the recordings and there is, there's a ton of overdubs and it's, it's done on purpose, yeah. you know? Well, you know, you come from that era of just mi- production, <laughs> production, you know, I mean, it's cool. Like sometimes I hear John's vocals come out of nowhere, like from behind, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And some of the call and responses he does is yeah. really good, but man, I mean, Jeff and Phil yeah. are on fire. I'm like, listen, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I have to, what did he do? I had to push it back. Like it's insane. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. You know, yeah, everybody, and, they played great. Everybody played amazing on this record. I think so too. And with the guitars going back to guitars, they're not shredding. I would say they're more, singing yeah yeah i mean they've never really been like from the shredder school they're both those guys i think i can speak for them on this that they come from blues based you know rock bands and like i mentioned bands from the 70s so a lot of their heroes are bands that are are guitar players that were sort of lyrical in their in their lead playing you know and less sort of flashy you know yeah so that kind of came a little later I guess you could say um, the full shredding flash thing. But um, so I think that they pay attention to that a lot. You know, they want their leads to tell a story and to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And and like you said, be melodic, you know, I think that's really important for them. And and they they killed it on this. They killed it. Not, I mean, when you listen to the song, great song, then when you dive into it and dissect it, everyone is playing for the songs, but adding some sort of, coolness to it you know what i mean yeah like, yeah yeah like they're push. you guys are pushing it without having to go f- without having to push it really you know <laughs> it's like yeah. all right i'm gonna go up to this line because if i go any further it's gonna get ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> that's how i see the record you know yeah, I mean? like reel it reel it back in come on yeah yeah reel it back in but dude, exactly amazing record Before, well, thank you there's a, a fan submitted question for both of us that i'm gonna play for us here Oh, cool. This Dave from Belgium. Here we go. Hey, guys. David here from Belgium. Uh, Just (laughs) wanted to start off by saying I'm a huge fan of both Death Angel and Armored Saint. Um, I've seen you uh, numerous times here in Belgium uh, and in the UK and in Holland. Uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to see some live shows again soon. In fact, the final show I saw before the pandemic was Death Angel in Brussels here in Belgium. It was awesome. Wow, uh, cool. but it's been a while unfortunately um my question i've uh i saw both your live stream shows uh that things was a christmas show armored saint uh, record release show for punching the sky uh they were awesome not the same than uh, a live show of course uh being there live uh but uh, it was a nice alternative my question is in the future when everything hopefully goes back to normal um will you still be st- Dreaming some of those special shows like the Death Angel Christmas show because it's not easy or cheap uh, for a fan like me to travel to uh, America. <laughs> Cheers, thanks, and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> what do you think, that's, Joe? Uh, your streaming great. show. Yeah, yeah, I think it's great. I mean, I love it when fans submit questions. It's yeah, awesome. It's cool. And, uh, you do it on video, too. I, I don't mean to digress here, but that's, no. that's a, cool, a cool feature. Thank you, thank you. That's you right. know, and I'm stoked that fans, you know, do submit questions. Now, the that's a good question, I think, for both yeah. of us. If the world opens up, yeah, would you still stream shows? You know, I've thought about this and I've talked about it with other people. I don't think it hurts, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm totally with you. Um, I, 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 I guess we're gonna both be honest here, right? So, like, I feel like uh, it was a little weird. But you, I'll let you. You may agree with me, probably, but but it was. It's kind of weird um playing in a venue with no one in there uh it's just weird it's not the same yeah and it's not the same for the fans i'm sure like any someone else in the rest of the world 
uh, watching it, it's not the same for them either. But having said that, um, I think that this format is probably here to stay. Yeah. Um, for the very reason that he mentioned, like whenever there's a special show, like the, such as the DA Christmas show, for example, um, a lot of people don't get to go because they don't live in SF, you know, so they, they need, they, but if you provided them with this streaming platform, yeah, it will, it allows you to your reach to go so much further, you know? Um, and so I would say that for, I'll answer for me anyway, and then I, I want to hear what you say too, but um, I would say that we are, we would consider doing it again. Um, and even if we play a live gig in front of people, like let's say the world opens up, again and and they let you you can go to shows again yeah sure i would consider filming or recording a show and and then broadcast that show to other parts of the world i i mean i don't really see a reason why not you know if there's a demand for it and if people you have fans all over the world that they want to see that show that you played in columbus ohio or wherever like let's make it available for them you know i think that would be a cool thing i i would have to agree with you because what do you think I, I wholeheartedly agree, especially like it's here to stay. It's not going to go away. You know, of course, yeah. it's, you know, I 100 percent. It's not the same, you know, playing that empty venue. I'm sure for fans, it's different, but it's something to look forward to. Like, yeah, you know, I had this talk. I had uh, the guys in obituary uh, on my stream. We were talking about this and it's like it's like the old days when you used to get they talked about getting the ultimate revenge on cassette. Because they couldn't see that lineup like Slayer. I mean, was it Venom, Slayer, and Exodus? That lineup that yeah. didn't come to their town, but they always watched the cassette. So it's kind of like a cool thing. So when they did, when one of the bands came to town, they were stoked to see to see that band. Right. So sure. I, I I think it's 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 a good thing. I, I I wouldn't be against streaming when the world opens up. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, like I said, it it's like going to be a platform that I think is probably going to stick around. And, yeah. and I think it's a, it's a cool thing. You know, I think, I just think it is, you know, what's funny when this first, when the lockdown first started, at least here in the U S last May, right. Or last April is when it really like, Oh yeah. And so one of the first bands that I saw doing a stream was, was um, Catatonia and they did a, like a live from the studio thing. It was really early on, like early June of 20. And at first it was like, what is this live stream? Like, what does that mean? And I didn't know anything about it. And it was one of the first that I ever saw. And I bought a ticket. You know, I actually liked the band. And yeah. Um, uh, and I just want, I also wanted to just see what it was all about. And I, I was, I was, I was stoked. I mean, it was kind of weird at first because it yeah. was like, they're playing in front of nobody. It's just them in a studio but they lit it in a way it was kind of artsy and, and stuff. And then I just, I just accepted it after a few songs and I just watched it on my, on my TV, <laughs> cranked it on the surround, you know, and, and I was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. I actually liked it. And now I know how people feel in other parts of the world that like a tour, you, cause you know, as well as I do, like you can't play every single city on a tour. Like, no, no. <laughs> and you get those fans who like, they either message your boards or they write letters or something. And they're like, why don't you come to et cetera, et cetera, where I yeah. live. You never come to my tour or my part of the world. And a lot of people just don't have access to live shows. They just don't. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a way to reach those people. And I think it's a cool thing. I think so too. When you, when you want to reach people like, Hey man, how come you don't come to Vietnam? Well, you know, it's not We'd that easy. To. It's not that easy. We'd love to, but you know, yeah. there's a lot of factors behind it. So, I mean, doing live streams, I think it's cool. It's it's a worldwide thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but yeah. I, I totally wouldn't be against it, and I'm with you on that, dude. Yeah, yeah. Totally I think it's cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, Joey. What I normally do, we're getting to the end of the this uh, the show here. I usually ask my guests twelve questions. Like it's a dirty dozen. I'm gonna throw out twelve questions to you. And you can answer it to me. You're gonna give me an answer, my good friend Joey Vera. And the first All question, right. first question is, and this is oh perfect. Will I, will I be quizzed on? Like, is this a? No, no. Just throwing out a question. You just answer it. And the first one is perfect for you. I swear it wasn't there. It wasn't right. me. M mild or spicy? <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. Yeah. Um, spicy. 
All right. Dogs or cats? Dogs. I love cats too, but I'm a dog guy. I love cats too, but dogs. A movie you can watch over and over again. The Thing. John John Carpenter's The Thing. Okay. You're going old school here. What's your... um, What's your biggest pet peeve? Ooh, uh, that's a good one. Uh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> you, you stumped me. Third question already. Yeah. Uh, God, I don't know. I think the older I'm getting, it's changing. It's probably, I probably uh, have little patience uh, in, in general. <laughs> which is weird because I'm people who know me and know me as being like a very patient guy. Yeah, but you that's are. Some, I'm starting to lose my patience the older I get. Yeah. Ah. Uh, well, I better watch out the next time I see you. Get off my grass, <laughs> God damn it! Get off my lawn! What time does your alarm clock go off every morning? My alarm clock goes off at 7.30 a.m. Wow. every day. Except for Saturday and Sunday. 7.45? If I'm, if I'm lucky. Okay, a song you a song you love to sing when you're all alone. Huh. Uh, wow. I don't think I have one in particular. You know, remember going back to the variety thing. Uh, it depends on the day, man. It could be Shining Star by Earth, Wind, and Fire, or it could be, you know, I don't know. We are the Road Crew by Motorhead. Don't know. There we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll get those two. What's your uh your dream vacation? Dream vacation, uh, sand and beach for sure. I like the, I like the ocean. It could be anywhere as long as the weather's nice and humid. Hawaii, uh, down in Mexico, uh, yeah, something like that. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. One thing about you that probably annoys others. That's a good question, man. <laughs> um, it's, it's probably uh the lack of answering questions um okay <laughs> I, I can take that if you want man that's okay <laughs> no, i'm gonna say uh i'm gonna say probably um uh my long drawn out storytelling okay i like long storytelling so some people get annoyed by it so okay. get get to the ending already okay well with me it's this when i'm on coffee it's 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 over dude you know <laughs> da, 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 da. i'm always like the ups man on the ups man on mad tv all right <laughs> your favorite smell uh, garlic and olive oil Ooh, that's good especially on bread awesome Ooh, an instrument you wish you could play you none i play them all <laughs> <laughs> uh you know i think drums and I can play oh. a little. I can play a little bit of drums, but I kind of. I always think about it, and I'm always toying with getting an electronic kit. I just never done it, but I'm a total closet drummer, and Gonzo hates me for that because I just like you know, dude, I you know, and it's like shut up, you're the bass player. But <laughs> I'm I'm like a drummer. I'm a drummer screaming, just screaming to get out. So I wish I was a better drummer. I would, okay. Yeah. Okay. On a scale of one to five, how good of a dancer are you? You know, I think I'm like a seven, but my wife says I'm a three. Like what is, what is, what's inside my head? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm feeling it. And my wife's like, dude, you're, you look so like non groovy. Like what is up with you? I don't know, so, man, man. I, I see, I see you rock out on stage. You got some soul. I think I think I have it. I feel it. But when it comes like if you take the guitar off me and it's yeah. just me and like me and like Sly and the Family Stone or something. Yeah. And my wife's like, why aren't you letting loose? Like, what are you why are you holding back? <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to you don't want to embarrass. I mean, you don't want to put people like people think, man, that's <laughs> got it, man. I better get off the dance floor and leave this guy. <laughs> yeah. What did yeah. you have? What did you have for breakfast this morning? Um, I have a routine, uh, but it's a variety of a routine. Today's today's was today was uh, whole wheat toast, cashew butter, and and banana slices. It's either nice. that, it's either that or avocado toast or protein shake. Um, those are the 
three go tos. Wow, you're all, you're Mr. Healthy, huh? Uh, you know, I I try to try to balance some of it. So, but I like I like having I like having very small light things for breakfast. Once in a while, I'll have eggs too. Cool. But, yeah, Joey, we're coming to the end. First, I want to tell everyone. If you didn't, if you don't have Punching the Sky by Armored Saint, I suggest you get it. Head on over to the Metal Blade website to their store, buy the CD, buy the vinyl, buy the Thank shirt. You. It's a great album. And while you guys are in the shopping mood after you buy their album, head over to our merch store because we got get some, some cool yeah, DA, get some DA stuff. Come on, we, we got some new stuff. So check that out. And first, again, as I started the show, Joey, happy birthday. Thank you so much. I'm going to see if I can play it again. I've been, talking, <laughs> I've been excited, dude. It was it. You, you, you got one under your belt. I Let's might. See. Let's see. I'll probably hit wrong notes. Everyone, please wish Joey Vera a happy birthday. Thank you. birthday joey thank you for that rules jump, jumping on the live and streaming i know you, you and your wife are probably gonna have a big celebration i took an hour out of your time on your thank birthday. you man it was my honor to be here with you and uh thank you so much it's great to see you i really miss likewise, you likewise man. man and uh what was it you the and mega trish the mega yeah that's the last time i saw you was was there i think and uh i mean we all miss each, our friends and yeah. it's like i just can't wait to to see everybody again and this was a this was like a gift for me just to see you for an hour like uh, it, it meant a lot to me so thank you so much and i just want to throw it out there dude you know we do have our annual christmas shows when the world opens up you know we've been trying yeah. to get you we've been trying to get you guys on our christmas <laughs> know, show, but things doesn't seem to work out logistics people are on vacation at that time yeah. Yeah. But hopefully one of these days it can be Death Angel Armor Saint. You know, it'd be our it'd be an honor to do it for us, you know. And, and yeah. we we'd love we just love you guys as people, you know that. So yeah, it would be just likewise. a blast just just to be in the same place. So to do a show with you guys like that would be an awesome thing. So yeah, let's let's you know we'll keep we'll keep working on it and hopefully one of these times it'll happen. It'd be great. Cool, cool. I hope yeah. so. Dude, like I, I, I can't get enough of the new record. Good job Thanks, on man. the record. Thank tell you so much. Tell the rest of the guys, great job and hello from us. Awesome. And we are signing out, everyone. Enjoy your Saturday. Yep. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>